This is Heart Rhythm TV, and I'm Daniel Aliesh. Welcome to Advocacy in Action. It is a very exciting time in atrial fibrillation care. Um, we are entering a, a new era with PFA ablation. It's widespread adoption. And for that reason, actually, Heart Rhythm TV will be doing focused special reporting on PFA, um, emphasizing understanding the data and science with regards to efficacy and, safe, efficacy and safety, as well as advocacy and reimbursement and payment. And for that reason, I'm joined today by Dr. Chris Liu. He's of Cornell University, and he's also the chair of the Heart Health Policy Committee. Welcome. Thanks, Dan. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. You know, I think that PFA, you know, it, it, it has always uh, been subject to um, a lot of expectation. And hopefully this promise of safety and efficacy will be um, will be realized. And I think it's showing promising promising data to that effect. However, um, you know, I think some of the concerns that we're seeing within the EP community is issues with insurance denials related to PFA and also issues related to discussions with hospital administrators around purchasing the PFA technology, understanding the implications on the cost of care. So Chris, can you tell us a little bit about what HRS and what the health policy community is doing to address these issues? Sure, yes. Um, so Dan, for those of us, uh, the, our members who have not uh, come up against this, uh, we recently uh, released a, uh, an advocacy in action uh, report about this. Uh, and of course, uh, from all the news that we've heard about PFA and all the excitement that it's generated, the other side of it is really, uh, of course, the cost of the uh, technology. So with any kind of uh, new novel technology and uh, PFA is certainly uh, part of that, there is additional cost associated with it. So if you have not uh, heard about this, uh, the equipment you know, is significantly more expensive than currently available ablation uh, technology. And so uh, so if you have not heard of this from your hospital administrators or other people in charge of the practice, uh, you will hear about it. Uh, and the cost of each uh, case. Uh, sorry, Chris, yeah. and just to kind of put a number on that, are, are we looking at probably around double the cost of an ablation catheter for a PFA catheter relative to an RF catheter? Those are the numbers. Uh, that as used. far as I understand, the cost is actually more than double. More than double. Yes. So now, of course, uh, you know, we're just talking about the ablation catheters. So if you uh, then you have to add in whether you're using additional mapping catheters uh, and mapping systems on top of that. So uh, so just the ablation catheters, the PFA ablation catheters versus standard RF ablation catheters, my understanding that it's uh, two to three times more the cost. OK, so uh, you can tell immediately that, that is going to be an issue because uh, frankly, many of the hospitals, certainly in the in the United States, and um, you know, certainly I imagine around the world, uh, run on relatively small margins. And so, in the United States, uh, CMS will reimburse a standard fee for each ablation procedure. And so, no matter how much or how little equipment you use, uh, you get a standard fee for the hospital. And so uh, if the cost of the procedure goes up significantly, that's going to uh, impact the margins of that procedure for the facility. Uh, this is, again, regarding the facility payment, not the physician payment. And Chris, um, tell me a little bit, a bit about, you know, HRS has come across in, uh, news of insurance denials related to PFA being ex an experimental technology. Tell that's me right. Tell more about that. Right. So unlike CMS, some of the commercial insurance payers will have a pass-through mechanism where the equipment and uh, its costs are passed on from the facility to the payer. And so the added cost of something like PFA then could be passed on to these third-party commercial insurance payers. And that's the part of the reason I imagine that several of them, as we announced, uh, including Aetna, uh, Anthem, and Humana, have announced that uh, pulse field ablation uh, for cardiac ablation, as well as apparently for tumor treatment, which it is also used for, 
is considered uh, investigational uh, technology and therefore not medically necessary. And so they have essentially said that they would deny payment for procedures using pulse field ablation. Now it's it's interesting, and this is something that uh, certainly in my own uh, experience uh, on health policy here at HRS that we haven't really come up against before because this is the same procedure. So an AFib ablation 93656 as the CPT code that then the insurance company might deny payment for based on the technology that is being used. And so um, uh, I personally am still not sure and I have not experienced in uh, my own practice uh, whether this uh, has happened or will happen, uh, but certainly this is something that our members should be aware of and should be prepared for uh, so that their patients who have commercial insurance, uh, certainly with any of these payers, uh, if they're going through an ablation procedure and pulse field ablation is used, uh, that there is the possibility that the procedure might be denied payment after the fact. Uh, and I'm not sure you know, how the authorization before the procedures would work, uh, whether it would include uh, the use of PFA or something like that. You know, that's exceptionally confusing, in my opinion, <laughs> with FDA approved, you know, two separate FDA approved technologies for PFA. And I, I'm hoping that, you know, this is more of a blip in a rollout and uh, it starts making a little more sense to me um, because when it's FDA approved, uh, by definition, it's not investigational for its for its indication. Uh, tell us a little bit about what HRS is doing to help uh, electrophysiologists advocate with payers, advocate with their administrations to combat this issue. Yes, so uh, certainly we, we know that this is a priority because of all the excitement and the um, uh, anticipation of using PFA uh, in the arrhythmia world. Uh, we are uh, contacting and reaching out to these commercial payers to try to engage them and to uh, is, uh, essentially provide as much as we can the evidence uh, for the safety and efficacy of PFA that led to the FDA approval, exactly like you said, Dan. Uh, we are also in the process of drafting a letter uh, that essentially will lay out our statement about the uh, scientific evidence for PFA in arrhythmia treatment, uh, specifically atrial fibrillation, uh, and uh, some of the reasons that uh, patients and physicians would choose PFA to treat the arrhythmia condition. And so, Hopefully, this kind of letter released by the Heart Rhythm Society will be a document that can be used by physicians and practices and patients to get the commercial payers and uh, you know third-party payers to understand the importance of this technology and to uh, you know essentially um, uh, request uh, appeals uh, in this in the case of denials. And to those watching this video, I mean, we want this video and this letter to be a resource to you. So this letter is forthcoming and a link will be provided in the description of this video to that letter as soon as it's available. Um, so, well, thanks, Chris. Um, switching gears a little bit, um, discussions within the community, EP community, as well as, you know, murmurs, maybe even industry initiated around taking pulse field ablation technology and taking it out of the electrophysiology practice and maybe even more broadly into interventional cardiology. Talk to me a little bit about this and, and what is what are your thoughts? What's, what's our approach? Right, so of course, we're always um, keeping our ears open and our eyes open to um, developments in the field. Uh, and this is really something that, um, you know, I think as industry has really tried to promote the technology and how quote unquote simple it is, uh, that it has naturally garnered the attention of, um, you know, of other specialties. And so we have heard rumblings uh, that interventional cardiologists might be interested in uh, exploring the possibility of using PFA uh, and doing these ablation procedures. And, and uh, you know, so I want to make it clear that this is just, you know, uh, rumblings that we've heard uh, from maybe some sectors and, um, you know, it's um, it, it really is something that um, we're not thinking is uh, ultimately going to uh, take place, mostly because as we, of course, in the EP community understand that 
doing an ablation procedure, especially for AFib, is more than much more than just about putting a catheter somewhere in the heart and stepping on a pedal or turning uh, on some energy. So when we're treating arrhythmias, we need to be prepared for all the possible different mechanisms, mapping, uh, troubleshooting, the, the challenging circuits that we all deal with every day uh, that make an AFib ablation much more than just about, uh, you know, putting a catheter in a pulmonary vein and pressing a, a few buttons. So, um, but this is something that we on the health policy committee and uh, at HRS leadership, I know, uh, are very much, uh, you know, certainly uh, paying attention to. And um, and so we're certainly prepared to, um, you know, make statements about um, standards that should be met uh, for ablation procedures. Uh, and so, um, so this is something that remains to be seen. Uh, we'll have to, um, I think, engage industry so that they understand uh, the limitations of just the technology and that the medicine part of this and the physiology part of the electrophysiology is uh, really still remains the primary uh, part of doing these procedures. So, you know, Chris, I, I just want to piggyback on what you're saying. Um, I find, yeah, I find these rumors to be wholly confusing as well. Um, you, you know, the field of electrophysiology has over a decade and a half uh, of experience understanding the pathophysiology of atrial fibrillation and understanding how can you positively impact um, this condition with ablation. You know, we spent all this time refining thermal ablation, understanding how do we do it safely? How do we do it durably? How do we create durable lesions? And at the same time, we've also uh, pioneered a novel non-thermal technology. Um, and we're looking to roll that out with a hope of delivering on safety. So I think it's wholly con uh, kind of confusing to see how, given the track record of success within electrophysiology with regards to AFib ablation, a true arrhythmia care, how it's not completely common sense to continue to develop it within the field of electrophysiology, given this is just right in the center of our wheelhouse. And we have developed so much, um, so much scientific progress within the field. Uh, completely agree, Dan. So um, let's move on to kind of, you know, our final discussion point, um, talking a bit about pulse field ablation you know, a huge area of excitement. I, I want to emphasize, I probably say this all the time, you know, it's a really exciting time to be an electrophysiologist. PFA as a novel uh, ablation technology has the promise of delivering specifically with, with regards to safety and hopefully with efficacy. And we're going to learn a lot in this intervening amount of time for how to best to apply and use this technology. I guess I'll ask you, Chris, you know, framing our discussions around our excitement for PFA, and specifically related to outcomes and maybe even speed. What's the, you know, what's your perspective on how we should think about this? Well, um, so it comes from different sides. Certainly uh, my own uh, practice as uh, an arrhythmia specialist, as an electrophysiologist, uh, and certainly for those of us who've been in the field for a number of years, we've also come across various technologies uh, that maybe did not quite have the same level of excitement as PFA so far, uh, but have also been pretty exciting at the time, and some of them uh, didn't really pan out. So part of me as a practitioner and as a physician always has that in the back of my mind. And I think as part of that, and uh, just exactly like you said, Dan, is that the efficacy and how to use PFA, which patients, when, uh, versus currently available radiofrequency thermal ablation, uh, it still re really remains a question to be answered. And so in that respect, um, you know, this is still something that we really need to reconcile with, see what the real world results are from PFA use. Uh, many of us will figure out our own uh, strengths and limitations with each of these technologies and how we work with them. Uh, and using them in the different patient populations that we treat. And, um, and so uh, from the health policy side, I think we really need to uh, remember that um, speed 
which is frankly, you know, what often industry is marketing and promoting uh, for patients. And um, in many ways for us as physicians, speed is not the number one goal. And, um, you know, when patients go through an ablation procedure, weeks or months or years later, they're not looking back to say, well, well, I'm really glad that procedure took two hours uh, and not three. <laughs> and so they're usually thinking about, am I, ha <laughs> am I having arrhythmia? Am I having AFib still? Or am I free of arrhythmia? So I think speed is something that we really have to be careful with. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, just as we learned from what happened with the ablation reimbursement codes from several years ago, uh, doing something faster uh, doesn't always uh, uh, pay for the physician. So, uh, so as these procedures become faster, we want to, um, you know, become cognizant or certainly be cognizant that uh, that achieving faster speed um, is not something that, um, uh, you know, that uh, will necessarily help the patients uh, or us. Uh, more so than the quality of the procedure that we're doing. And I think that really remains to be the uh, main goal that we should have. You know, I, I think the long and the short of it is we don't really know, right? We, we, we don't know what the implications of this technology is with regards to all of these outcome measures. And if you look at efficacy, right, you look at safety, and then you look at procedural time, right? Which those first two are, are kind of, heads and shoulders above in, as far as importance to our clinical practice. I, I can't help but thinking about, you know, being a fellow and hearing my faculty say to me, you know, focus on being good, don't focus on being fast. And um, I think you have to continuously apply that to how you adopt new practices, how you always try to improve yourself. And, and as you said very succinctly, right, it, I'm, I am going to say that it's, it's extremely unlikely that a patient when you're, you're meeting post the blanking period is gonna shake your hand and say, uh, thank you for doing my procedure so quickly. They're, yep. gonna, they're gonna be happy they're safe. They're gonna be happy it worked. And I think that should be our messaging moving forward. Let's focus on what's best for the patient. And in the promise of PFA ablation, number one, safer. Number two, hopefully at least more as efficacious and hopefully more. Um, but thank you very much, Chris, for your time and for your advocacy for um, for electrophysiologists. And thank you Pleasure, all for tuning Dave. in. And thank you all for tuning into Heart Rhythm TV.